Hello, everyone. This is Angela Lin. I'm a medical geneticist at Mass General Hospital. Uh, many of you know me as the co-director of our MGH Myrie Syndrome Clinic. And I'm so pleased to be talking to you about hearing loss. The title is fairly fancy, Impact of SMAD4 Gain-of-Function Variants on Hearing Loss in Myrie Syndrome, Implications for Treatment Across the Lifespan. And I had given this talk a few weeks ago at a genetic meeting. I want to thank some other people who are noted on this title uh, slide. Above all, Eleanor Simone, our wonderful clinical research coordinator. Terrific. Lisa Scamenti, my colleague from the Mayo Clinic, Michael Cohen at Mass Ioneer, Alicia Quinnell from Mass Ioneer, Carlton Corrales from Mass General Brigham, and Mark Lindsay, who's the co-director of the clinic with me. So the purpose of this talk is to characterize the type and frequency of hearing loss in a well-phenotype cohort of people with Myrie syndrome. So instead of just gathering patients that have been reported in the literature, these are people we've actually seen, many of you listening. We want to describe habilitation. How does somebody cope with hearing loss amplification? And we hypothesize that hearing loss and Myrie syndrome might correlate to the genotype, to the specific variant. SMAD4 activation, which is the way the gene acts, impacts sensory neural and conductive components of sound perception. And before I go on, I just want to pause to say all patient photos have been provided with consent. This cartoon is from um, Shutterstock, shows you a diagram that you've probably seen several times before. It's the ear from the outside to the inside. And coded in red is the outer ear. Start with the pinna, the auricle, the canal, external auditory canal to the tympanic membrane. Looks like a little drum. And then we switch in purple to the middle ear. And those structures are these little bones, the malleolus, incus, stapes, and the, excuse me, and the stapes, they're the inner ear bones. There's the tympanic cavity and something called a round uh, window, which leads to the green part, and that is the inner ear. And so we have this remarkable structure, the semicircular canals and the cochlea, it looks like a shell, as well as the nerve, the vestibular and the cochlear nerves that innervate these structures. So I dedicate this talk to our patients who have been our teachers forever, but especially for this talk. It's one thing to be a geneticist to know about hearing loss. It's another thing to live with it as many of my patients did. And I thank in particular Patty, and I can say her name because she's in the public domain. And this is uh, Patty and her dear friend. And this is her undear dog, Lunifer, caught in the act. And she said, I have never had both malfunction at the same time until now. At $2,500 a pop, I wear them until they are at death's door. <clears throat> Even when they ask what sound quality is like in the audiologist um, office, <clears throat> there will always be a period of adjustment. And when your kid does not want to wear his or her aids, pay attention. Uh, the low noises are loud and clear. The higher noises like female voices are too soft. She was saying this as she was adjusting hers. Almost everything is adjustable these days. And I can tell you when I read these at the meeting, all the geneticists, they really appreciated this insight. So some background. Myrie syndrome, like other genetic disorders, can be cataloged by a database called Mendelian Inheritance in Man or MIM, and it has a number. It's rare, one out of a million. It's increasingly diagnosed, but it's still rare, but it may be a little bit more common, and it's distinctive. It's caused by recurrent gain-of-function variants in SMAD4, and variance is the word that we use now instead of mutation. There is genetic homogeneity, which means that these are the same type of variants that we've been seeing, and here they are. The most common one seen in 50% is a change from the protein isoleucine, excuse me, the change in the protein from the amino acid isoleucine at a position called 500 to valine. And then there are a couple of them that are seen total less than 5%. Second most common is uh, seen in 40%, and this change uh, involves arginine to 400 at position 496 to cysteine. And you know, years ago, when this first came out, this was called the rare variant, but you can see they're almost half and half now. So there's phenotype heterogeneity. It means the way people look, there's a broad spectrum. And yet, almost every organ system is involved. The natural history means the changes over time, and we can say that most, but not all patients have most features at some point. Again, most, but not all patients have most, 
but not all features at some point. It doesn't mean that these happen all at once. Diagnostic trends, as you listeners know, increase diagnoses in both younger, less than two years of age and older patients. And what's older? Older, we generally say is something older than 20. We think of 18 to 20 as adults, so lots more. And there's an earlier use of these diagnostic gene panels, some for intellectual disability, autism, hearing loss, cancer, and short stature. More frequent use of exome sequencing, rarely something called genome sequencing. And evidence-based criteria are in development. Pragmatically, for practical purposes, use the gene reviews that we wrote last year. What are the clinical features? You know better than, than me. So we know that growth is usually impacted, growth retardation, small for gestational age, sort of a compact body, but you know what? Not everybody. We know that with the arginine variant, more likely to have normal uh, build. A characteristic face that changes over time, we say the eyes are short, there's a flatness of the cheekbones, there can be a prominent jaw, there can be a prominent nasal tip, uh, short filtrum, thin lips. And we'll talk about the hearing loss. But why talk about the face? And I'll show you this fantastic montage created by one of the mothers of a boy that I follow. And I love this little face, the little face, the little children, they look so similar, don't you agree? And over time, you can see the face changing. And like anybody, the face changes with time. That's nothing different. And so in the heart, we talk about the problems with the aorta, coarctation, which is the indentation, it can be recurrent, come back again if it um, is operated upon, uh, segmental narrowing, diffuse aorta hypoplasia. And the heart defects include little things like ASD, VSD, a PDA, Rarely it can be something like a tetralogy of below. And the pericardial disease occurs in about 10%. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is rare. I'm not going to define these in detail because uh, my colleague, Mark Lindsay, is giving a talk on this as part of the conference. So what about psychologic behavioral issues? Developmental delay, I would say really in all people, some type of academic challenge. Intellectual disability, however, is not in everybody. In fact, it's probably a smaller number. Autism and the spectrum to social disability probably present in some degree in almost everybody. Notice I say almost everybody. ADHD, depression, anxiety, OCD. Schizophrenia is super rare, but it has occurred. Lung disease refers to the restrictive stiff chest wall. Interstitial refers to the interior of the uh, rib cage where the lungs are premature puberty in some, and as you know, connective tissue proliferation, stiff joints, straight spine, arthritis, cervical vertebral fusion, thick skin, scars, pericardial, pleural, peritoneal effusions, and exudates. And I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to define these further because really the focus is on hearing loss. And here's a young woman showing her uh, stiffness, her stiffness of her spine, the little bump there, we call that kyphosis, and difficulty reaching the floor. So what about hearing loss in general? Well, as you know, there is conductive hearing loss. It's a good word, conduction of the sound wave from the outside to the external ear to hit the inside. And this is a typical clear, glossy tympanic membrane. Here's one that is probably infected with fluid. And this one is really infected. It's opaque and it's kind of red. Microtia refers to smallness of the ear. And if it's really small, there is no ear. This does not happen in Myrie syndrome, everybody. I'm showing it only to illustrate causes of conductive hearing loss. I repeat, this is not part of Myrie syndrome. But this is something called autosclerosis. Auto refers to the ear, sclerosis refers to stiffening of the bone, and that is part of it. We'll show it later on. What about sensory neural? So there are cochlear abnormalities. Again, this fantastic structure called the cochlea and the semicircular canals. And then you have these nerves. There's, we have 12 cranial nerves and it's the eighth that's involved in hearing loss. And finally, you can have mixing. So what's in the literature now? So in our gene reviews that we wrote last year, we did make a statement about hearing loss seen in most individuals. It's kind of a general statement. Evident early childhood, late teens, predominantly conductive or mixed, inner ear anomalies are rare. The underlying law, hearing loss is often unclear or unknown. And there's often a history of bilateral tubes being placed. This is a, a, this is a table from a paper by the group in France. The um, senior investigator is Valérie Cormier-Dare, and the first author is named uh, Yang. And in his 
in this paper, they have a table that shows you different age groups, infancy, toddler, early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence, adult, and when different things appear. And they had noted that hearing impairment appears in early childhood. I'll actually broaden it because I think we've seen this appearing in children who are less than two, and we certainly see it uh, being detected in older in the older adults. So here is an interesting case report. It's just a single case, just one patient. And uh, what they were trying to show is um, that in this patient who had the common uh, isoleucine de valine uh, uh, variant, um, they had a large series. So the interest wasn't just the one patient, but the whole series. They looked at the literature. And so in their series, at least half had this valine variant, which we see too. Surprisingly, they had a lot with this um, threonine change and then 16%, uh, 16, and then 3% with the methionine. And what they have is this gigantic table where they looked at everybody in the literature to their credit, and they looked at the patient, they looked at the type of variant, age of onset, et cetera. And they were able to conclude then that conductive hearing loss occurred in about 27%, sensory neural about 10%, mixed in about 18%, usually bilateral, rarely just one side. And it does tend to progress over time. And so that's the reason for following people. There's another case report. Now, case reports have to be viewed carefully because it doesn't mean it applies to everybody. But this single case did illustrate some things. This is a patient who had autosclerosis. And I know there are people listening who probably have this. It's not common, but it does happen. And it means that the bone in the, inner, the middle ear is remodeled. Um, this person also had a tiny, tiny little uh, tumor called a schwannoma, very, very tiny. So this, I, I created this for the uh, doctors that I was uh, speaking to. And this showed a variety of other syndromes that um, have hearing loss, something called CHARGE, something called the BOR, Turner syndrome, Wardenburg, Treacher Collins. Again, I'm just telling you these things just for your interest. And I show this to everybody because I wanted them to understand how common Myrie syndrome was. It's about midway, okay? So you have some syndromes where it's almost everybody, and then the, there's a syndrome that has a SMAD4 mutation, but it's not like my syndrome called HHT or juvenile polyposis, no hearing loss. So again, to, can, to show you how different these two are, same gene, different action, and different uh, phenotype. So we looked at patients from 2015 to last year when the clinic was founded, 47. All of them had had um, a gene test because that is required to make the diagnosis of Myrie syndrome. We did not look at the literature. There were probably about 115, but you know, with time, there's probably at least 150, maybe even uh, 200. They're usually coming in small uh, case reports, not large series. So we looked at the hearing loss overall. Uh, two were also followed at the Mayo Clinic. One is also followed at MGV Brigham. And we looked at the audiometry, inner ear anomalies on CT and MRI the gene and the overall Myrie syndrome phenotype classified them by severity. And so as many of you know already, this is what an audiogram looks like. And so this is the right ear and the left ear. The right ear is usually coded in red with circles. The left ear is coded in blue with little squares. And this is a normal hearing test. So notice that the right and the left are the same. We have the air conduction, the bone conduction, and they're in this uh, normal range. And this is pretty obvious. This is somebody who has hearing loss. You can see it, you know, the uh, ability to detect sound at uh, the higher uh, frequencies. This is up to 1,000, 2,000, goes way down. So let's look at um, uh, another type of an audiogram. This is for conductive hearing loss. And there's a separation between the normal bone conduction brackets and then what's happening down here uh, from the air conduction. And this is something that's sort of the opposite sensory neural both bone and ear are impacted. You get this kind of a shape. So in our study, I think I mentioned close to half of our patients had this isoleucine, position 500, change to valine. And then the next common is the change at 496 from arginine to cysteine, 38%. 11% uh, had the change to threonine, and one patient, one person, has this special change of isoleucine to leucine. And what about testing? Well, it seems that exosequencing is be by far the most common in 72%, and at least in one patient was done as a research study. 
genome sequencing, which is broader than exome sequencing, was done in uh, uh, 6%, and a targeted gene test was done in uh, 4 which is 9%. Panels were used to screen for autism, uh, cancer, or something else. And hearing loss uh, itself brought the person to diagnostic testing in 3 uh, the patients all had some other issues going on, but it was really the hearing loss that pressed the, the uh, doctor to say, let's find out what the genetic basis is. So hearing loss was seen in our series in almost 40%, so a little bit less than half. And it was more common in those who had the isoleucine to 500 the veiling. It, and so you compare 48% to the 17% of those who had the arginine. Now, there may be some people listening who say, well, wait a minute, I have the arginine variant and I have hearing loss. We're not saying that it can't happen, it's just less common. So the types of hearing loss, so conductive was most common, mixed was next, excuse me, mixed was the most common, conductive was the second most common. Sensory neural, just pure sensory neural, we saw it really only on one person. The average age of onset was 6.8 years. You can see it spans from uh, 15 months up to 13 years, and it did progress in about a third. So what types of habilitation were used? So hearing loss, so I should say that some type of habilitation was attempted in most patients, 72%. Hearing aids in 10 out of 13, a Baja bone anchor hearing aid in three, nobody had cochlear implants. And that would make sense because I think I said that we had a uh, very, we only had one person who had pure sensory neural hearing loss. So back to the types of habilitation that were used here. Um, auditory and oral communication was attempted by 18. The most, eight, most interesting thing, and by the way, this is um, um, 18 of those who had hearing loss. So in our cohort, American Sign Language was used more by people who were nonverbal without hearing loss. Let me say this again. You would expect American Sign Language to use by those who had hearing loss, but surprisingly, it is such an effective method of communication that some people who have who are nonverbal, um, but they don't have hearing loss, it's actually an effective way to communicate. It really impressed me, and I learned that. So the CT scan can be done of the temporal bone in particular, but you can also get something from the head and the maxillofacial region, and that was done in about half of the patients. You could see one problem, more than one. It involved the cochlea in five, bony problems in five, dysplastic inner ear semicircular canal dehiscence. So we are picking up things. And I'm gonna show some sample uh, people. And these have been of course identified. This is a person, this is a male. He had the threonine variant. And when we saw him at age five years, is, um, we saw there was an MRI that did show some problem with the semicircular canal. Interestingly, his behavioral audiogram was normal at that time. We feel that because of Myrie syndrome, he is likely to have hearing loss and he will need a high quality audiogram. Now, as all of you know, if you have a child with Myrie syndrome and autism, getting that high quality audiogram is really hard. And sometimes the children need anesthesia and we endorse that. We're not saying that we want to do it casually, but we think that the value of getting that information is so important. Here is a person who had um, a conductive hearing loss, and you see the big gap between the bone and then the air. And this was the valine um, uh, variant. And the, the CT scan, this is a CT scan uh, that was done at age two, it was actually normal. So I'm not gonna point out anything to here. It was actually read as normal. And what was important about this person is that they had a very modern type of bone conduction implant. It's called the Osseo Integrated. It's an active bone conduction implant. And it's remarkable because the transducer sits within the implant, positioned under the skin, and sends the sounds to the cochlea, but it's not really a cochlear implant. Here is another person, 20 years old, a male, and his variant involves threonine. He has mixed hearing loss and a variety of different abnormalities of the temporal bones, the mastoids, the semicircular canals, the cochlear ducts, the bone around the semicircular canal, autosclerosis, 
vestibular aqueduct. So I'm just sort of reading them very quickly. And this was his um, audiogram. And it is showing you again, here's the bone, here is the, uh, the air, and there's a separation. This is his CT scan showing that the left posterior semicircular canal is thickened, all right? It's foreshortened. And these are pictures sent kindly to me by his mother to help me understand. I needed to understand how he went from an external Baja to the implanted one. This is his left side. You can see his eyeglass piece over there. And there's his hearing aid. And there's the area after surgery. And so after the surgery is done and healed nicely, then there is a period where the, uh, the, um, the hearing aid, the Baja is anchored to a, um, gosh, what did she call it? To sort of uh, a elastic, okay bandana, something like that. And then after that heals, then you can actually have the final uh, setup where you have the magnet and the Baja. And here you hear, see the here healed incision. Headband, that's the word I was grasping for, sorry. Titanium implant, the scar is healed. There's the Baja, the magnet, and the Baja. Here is an older woman, 42 years old. She's a female and she has the arginine to cysteine variant. She has mixed moderate hearing loss. So you can see here's the bone conduction, the sensor, this is the right side, is, uh, uh, there's a separation. And then on the left side, the same thing, the, neither side is, neither type is completely normal. And this is her CT scan. And it was read as showing the middle ears were aerated, but there was dense bone in the sclera, uh, excuse me, in the mastoid and petrous region. And there's another area, it's just a fine point, I'm not gonna go over that. She did not have autospongiosis, was not present. And this is something that I use during this, learning about this is this is a normal temporal bone CT. These are tough to read. I admire the people who do this in radiology and it outlines the different parts of the bone. This is called the squamous. This is called the mastoid. See how bubbly it is because it's air filled normally. And the petrous part should also have bubbles in it. It's air filled sacs. And the tympanic part, let's see, I'm not sure where that is. And the style of process, these are just very tiny. And here they are all labeled. So how about somebody else? 35 year old, a female. She has the arginine to cysteine variant, bilateral, mixed, conductive and sensory neural hearing loss from bilateral autosclerosis. And there's a little arrow pointing to the area that's involved. And you can see looking at this, first of all, red is the right, blue is the left. And you can see how there is some areas where there's big separation. What's interesting though is here, this person has excellent word recognition. If you had seen this part, you would think that she would not be able to hear, communicate, but she does. And so even though she has pathology, she has abnormality, she does have ability to compensate. We see that sometimes. And this is her CT scan, which shows clear evidence of bilateral autosclerosis. The right is greater than the left. And I need these little arrows to help me out. And finally, a woman who is 51 and her variant changes to leucine, which is considered the mildest one so far. And yet she has severe profound sensory neural hearing loss. This is her audiogram. You can see how the bone conduction is way down here on both of them, on both sides. And uh, by however, it's been stable, which is good. And like another person, she actually has really great word recognition and benefits from conventional aids. So even though you heard about all these, some of these newer developments, sometimes hearing aids, if they're well-fitted, will help. And this is a hearing aid, it's worn outside, but when you tuck it behind the ear, you can't even see it. This is her CT scan from 2018. And it says that the right, uh, excuse me, the semicircular canal is suspected on the right and equivocal on the left side to have dehiscence. Dehiscence means peeling away. It's very abnormal. So hearing loss treatment, I think I've touched on most of these. Hearing aids for monitoring of word recognition, just to start out. The wearable FM Bluetooth devices. They're useful for school and noisy environments. Speech and language services. So it's not just the gadgets, right? It's the service that we need to do too. So needed for deaf, hard of hearing children to develop speech and improve articulation. American Sign Language. It's a remarkable visual mode of communication that can be used in a variety of settings. Sometimes I've heard patients, parents, and providers wonder if using sign language will stigmatize the child, will make it obvious that they can't hear, can't communicate. I think those of us who advocate for it see it another way. It allows somebody to communicate, and that, above all, 
is what helps somebody integrate into the world. So bone conduction, hearing aid, the Baja provides, provides bone conduction option without surgery. There is a surgical type also, and you saw the pictures of bone anchor hearing aids, different brands. A cochlear implantation has not been used in our patients, uh, at least not currently. This is the type of developmental pathway that we think about in genetics. We don't think about just this gene, SMAD. We think about, it's a, like a chain of dominoes, one thing going to the next, it's a cascade, it's like a waterfall. And in big red bullets are is SMAD form. And I'm not gonna go over it just to say, you can see that a lot of things feed into it, depending on how you, if you can see, there are other SMADs, there's SMAD one, five, SMAD two and three, SMAD six and seven. So this is SMAD four that is our interest. And so there is a mouse model for SMAD four, but not what we have in Myrie syndrome. There's a SMAD four loss of function. So you may wonder, is that useful? And we think it is because it does show that there is expression in the parts of the ear that are of interest to us, the cochlea, for example. And there has been uh, inactivation of this gene. And when you inactivate, it does show problems then. In particular, it shows problems with the development of the facial features. And we know in Myrie, the cheekbones are flat and there can be pro, uh, elongation of the jaw. So all I want you to do is to remember that, yes, there is a mouse model that has shown the expression in the inner ear. Now, if you go from the mice to the Myrie mouse model to humans. So at MGH, we have developed a mouse model and Dr. Uh, Lindsay will probably discuss it in his talk. So we do know that this is where this gene acts and we're going to see what happens in, in humans. We're not there yet, but we're, we're stepping slowly. So when I compare again, these different genes to hearing loss, uh, go over it. Uh, I think I said it, but actually I'll go over it now. Uh, I'm sorry. The most common association is with the three and E variant. So really 60%. And then close by is valine with 50%. And folks, you need to know that when we're dealing with such small numbers, 50 and 60% are really the same. There's not a big difference. But what is interesting is we found that the frequency with the R gene to cysteine uh, change is 17%, which is very interesting. And so if you've been keeping track on my different talks and stuff, I've mentioned that the RG496 cysteine variant is most likely to have normal stature. When I hear about a child who has Myrie syndrome and the doctor says, and he or she is growing really well, I think, oh, it's probably the RG variant. And then there is a, an association, though rare, with endometrial cancer in women. So the isoleucine to 500 valine uh, change seems to be the one that is associated with the airway stenosis, but you know, there's only been a few reports. I hesitate to even show this to you. The isoleucine, to, uh, isoleucine 500 change in threonine does seem to be more associated with severe aortic hypoplasia. So in summary, hearing loss is common, nearly 40%. It's typically mixed. Significant correlation between the gene and the appearance. And it was noted with, it was more prevalent with the isoleucine to 500 variant. Habilitation is personalized, may change over time. It requires motivation. And when I, by the way, when I show you this bullet point, I should ask each of you to be thinking, would you want to know early on if this variant, for example, in somebody is associated with hearing loss, would that help you? We think so. We think so because we wanna make sure we're on it. We are jumping on and doing the right testing as soon as possible. So what about habilitation is personalized? And this was an article in the Wall Street Journal recently, maybe some of you saw it. And what they were highlighting is that these are such beautiful pieces of technology. They're streamlined, they have different colors. Some kids like to wear them bright colors, others prefer sort of a, uh, a tone that blends with their, uh, the color of their ear. And um, they're saying that uh, uh, millennials think they're cool now. And this is a, an important set of slides. This is a, the mother of my patient, and you may know her very well. And I can say their names because it's on the slide. This is Alec and this is his mother, April. And this is from a fantastic video. And the spelling, uh, he's spelling his name. This is the C. And this is his mom talking about communication. Second summary is to say hearing loss should be actively sought. At the time of diagnosis, refer to ENT and audiology. So folks, it's not good enough to say 
oh, he can hear me, she can hear me. You really wanna pin it down with an audiology. If you think that your child has autism and that would prevent it, you're probably right, but just give it a try. And then in the, take the long view, we might have to do it with anesthesia. Follow up every one to three years, you can't just stop. Hearing loss may reflect the expression pattern of SMAD4 in both the mesenchymal and neural cells of the inner ear. It's, and here's something I'm really interested in. Could hearing loss be a therapeutic target if structural ear anomalies are present? So what this means is, I had given a talk last year that you may have seen about therapy. I said, we didn't, we didn't think we were going to be able to find one single cool gene uh, therapy that could just turn off everything and improve everything. So we were looking for things that could be targeted. What about blood pressure? What about skin? What about joints? And hearing loss might be on the list too. And I wondered, well, if you've got these structural differences, is it too late? And I think maybe not. I think that because the there is progression, that might actually be a clue that we could interfere. So this is what I would hope for. And by the way, we need to do additional study to evaluate balance and inner ear. So these are important issues, very important. And we haven't done a correlation between hearing loss and what we call comorbidities. If you have hearing loss, are you more or less likely to have a heart problem, more or less likely to have autism? And we don't know yet. Now, the actual pathology can only be guessed during life because the otic capsule that I showed you is deep in the ear, deep, deep in the head. And you can see that on the images. So a prospective study of hearing loss, first of all, in a larger cohort would be helpful. And in the event there is somebody who passes away, the post-mortem temporal bone analysis would be useful. So surveillance for hearing. So of course, everybody needs to get their uh, audiogram and we need to follow up. But what about imaging? So what about CT scan, ideally the temporal bone, a focused temporal bone? We think it's a strong recommendation. For us to say it's a definite recommendation, we have to have a very high bar. So far, what it's showing us is that it does tell us what's going on with the inner ear, absolutely. The question is, does it help us do a better job of treating the hearing loss? The other type of imaging is called the MRI. CT is actually better. Uh, the MRI is better for the internal auditory canal and same thing. And we're, we're trying to decide whether an MRI for the brain and then looking at the inner ear could be done at the same time. And this is one of our patients uh, looking like, I think a little ballerina at the ENT clinic. So I wanna thank everybody that helped me produce this talk that helps me every day. We have a great MGH team. You know, I'm a cheerleader for everybody. We have a great Myrie Syndrome uh, a prof Professional Advisory Board. And I apologize because I omitted the photo of Kathy Young. Sorry about that. And then we have an International Professional Advisory Board around the world. We have referring physicians I was speaking to, and we have you, the parents and the patients. And I thank the support from the Myrie Syndrome Foundation for helping me to hire Eleanor. And I also help, I also thank the individual families and uh, people who have provided gifts to our MGH fund, which is really necessary for a lot of the work that we do. And this is Eleanor, who you know well. These are references that you can go back and look at later on. Thank you, everybody.